it's a huge honour uh, for me to welcome Billy Collins here this evening. Billy is usually described as one of America's most popular poets, having been the New York State Poet Laureate and a two-time US Poet Laureate. However, his popularity seems only to have gathered force since those appointments, and I think it's safe to say that we do indeed have America's most popular poet in our midst tonight. Yeah. Um, although Billy had, of course, been publishing and receiving awards and fellowships in the US throughout the 80s and 90s, I don't think it was until the publication of his collection, Taking Off Emily Dickinson's Clothes, in the year 2000, the first of his books, I believe, to be published on this side of the Atlantic that his witty, powerful, charming, and darkly funny voice took hold over here. I was 17 at the time and working in a writer's retreat on the Barrett Peninsula, and to be honest, I had never heard of Billy Collins. I didn't think twice when, in early 2001, Sue, the director of the retreat, told me that this group of American writers were coming in the summer to take part in a poetry workshop, which was being led by Billy Collins. Not that we didn't work hard in getting the retreat ready for every visiting workshop, but we just tipped away in a relaxed manner, preparing for their arrival. <coughs> that was until it was announced, a week before they were to arrive, that Billy Collins had just been appointed Poet Laureate of the United States of America. <laughs> I didn't really understand what that meant either, but I could tell by the flurry of activity, the printing of actual menus, and the <laughs> I don't think they were distributed, but they were made up. The daily and early morning arrival of gardeners and cleaners that this was a big deal. And it did turn out to be a big deal for me in the end, as I was lucky enough to take a place in that workshop. Not because I was so good a poet, but because someone had dropped out at the last minute. And the organiser insisted that we must have full attendance for the Poet Laureate of the United States. <laughs> I had never been in a workshop like it, and although he's a very kind and funny man, that dark, powerful thing can really scare the hell out of you. <laughs> During his two terms as Poet Laureate, he pioneered a variety of innovative initiatives that saw poetry appear in unexpected places, the backs of cereal boxes, subway stations, and most importantly for Billy, I think, the classroom, with the publication of the Poetry 180 anthologies. He sought to make poetry a very natural part of our existence, proving also that any inspiration for poetry can be wrought from the ordinary, seemingly mundane parts of our lives. And although the laureateships are such a huge part of his literary biography, it isn't essentially what we know and love him for. It's the poems that are so inviting, so open, and often surreal from the outset. Poems that before we know it, have taken us somewhere unexpectedly forceful, where the punchline is often a punch in the gut line at the end and leaves us trying to find our breath again. So please join me in giving a warm welcome. I just have to, it's great to be here, but I do have to tell my version of that story with a little <laughs> shorter, which is I, I got to, um, like most Americans, I'd never been to, um, down into the Barra Peninsula, and uh, it's re kind of resistant to tourists, and, uh, and in fact, you can't get buses down there, I think. But the, um, the person who, who runs at Ankara uh, informed me that one of the Participants had to drop out because she was ill, and would I mind uh, having a 17-year-old local girl substitute? And I kind of rolled my eyes for a little bit and thought, I'm going to get this gothic, awful, <laughs> miserable poetry. And she immediately wrote circles around everyone else in the room. So I'm very proud of uh, having a little part in her, uh, her development. And uh, a lot of people since then have claimed her as their protege, but she's actually mine. <laughs> <laughs> Truly. So, um, I'm going to start with a poem called, <clears throat> it's called Walking My 75-Year-Old Dog. 
right away we have a problem. <laughs> Non-reliable narrator. Walking my 75-year-old dog, she's painfully slow, so I often have to stop and wait for her to study and sniff some roadside weeds, as if she were reading the biography of a famous dog. And she's not a pretty sight anymore, dragging one of her hind legs, her coat too matted to brush or comb, and a snout white as a marshmallow. She usually walks down a disused road with me that runs along the edge of a lake, whose surface trembles in a high wind and is slow to ice over as the months grow cold. We don't walk very far before she sits down on her worn haunches and looks up at me with her roomy eyes. Then it's time to carry her back to the car. Just thinking about the honesty in her eyes, I realize I should tell you that she's not really 75. She's 14. I guess I was trying to appeal to your sense of the bizarre, the curiosities of the sideshow. I mean, who really cares about another person's dog? Everything else I've said is true, except the part of being about her being 14. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's old, but not that old. And it's not nice to reveal the true age of a lady. <laughs> uh, this is a very American phenomenon, this next poem. I don't know if you've ever heard of the phenomenon of the Tennessee, uh, Tennessee fainting goats. Um, I didn't until fairly recently, but uh, you can verify this on, on, uh, on YouTube. All I can say is the Tennessee fainting goats um, fulfill every part of their three-part name. Um, and I had to, I, I reached for a pen as soon as I heard about this phenomenon. And it's called Down on the Farm. Whenever the conversation turns to the subject of Tennessee fainting goats, the question that always comes up is why? Are they so squeamish that they faint like Victorian ladies whenever a farmer uses language on becoming a gentleman? Or is it catching one goat fainting because he sees another one fainting? But that still leaves open the question of what makes the first goat faint. Does the memory of having keeled over one morning make one keel over again? Are they in love? Or is it all just too much? No one seems to know for sure, but it's something to think about when I'm trying to get to sleep at night or when I'm looking out the window at the barn and the fenced-in pastures beyond. To see a goat stiffen before pitching over on its side with a thump is truly unnerving. But when he rises in a minute as if, from the, as if from the dead and goes back to munching with his head down in the sweet grass on these hillsides, then everything seems okay again, just like before. And um, the question that if nothing else reveals um, that I've had a uh, pretty serious um, Catholic uh, schooling. It's called Questions About Angels. <coughs> Questions About Angels. Of all the angels you, sorry, of all the questions you might want to ask about angels, the only one you ever hear is how many can dance on the head of a pin. No curiosity about how they pass the eternal time besides circling the throne, chanting in Latin, or delivering a crust of bread to a hermit on earth, or guiding a boy and girl across a rickety wooden bridge? Do they fly through God's body and come out singing? Do they swing like children from the hinges of the spirit world, saying their names backwards and forwards? Do they sit alone in little gardens changing colors? What about their sleeping habits? the fabric of their robes, their diet of unfiltered divine light. What goes on inside their luminous heads? Is there a wall these tall presences can look over and see hell? If an angel fell off a cloud, would he leave, in a, hole, would he leave a hole in a river? And would the hole float along endlessly, filled with the silent letters about every angelic word? 
If an angel delivered the mail, would he arrive in a blinding rush of wings, or would he just assume the appearance of the regular man, ma mailman and whistle up the driveway, reading the postcards? No, the medieval theologians control, control this court. The only question you ever hear is about the little dance floor on the head of a pin, where halos are meant to converge and drift invisibly. It is designed to make us think in millions, in billions, to make us run out of numbers and collapse into infinity. But perhaps the answer is simply one, one female angel dancing alone in her stocking feet, a small jazz combo working in the background. She sways like a branch in the wind, her beautiful eyes closed, and the tall, thin bassist leans over to glance at his watch because she has been dancing forever, and now it is very late, even for musicians. <laughs> So I come up with a I came up with a secular ending, in spite of all that education. And this is a kind of a recent poem, but a poem that seems to have acquired uh, an expanding uh, readership. It's called Forgetfulness, and it just starts with um, uh, the idea of um, literary forgetfulness, or what someone called literary amnesia, where you um, look at all the books in your on your shelves and realize the contents of them have somehow disappeared from your head. <clears throat> Forgetfulness. The name of the author is the first to go, followed obediently by the title, the plot, the heartbreaking conclusion, the entire novel, which suddenly becomes one you have never read, never even heard of. <laughs> It is as if, one by one, the memories you used to harbor decided to retire to the southern hemisphere of the brain, to a little fishing village where there are no phones. Long ago, you kissed the names of the nine muses goodbye, and you watched the quadratic equation pack its bag. And even now, as you memorize the order of the planets, something else is slipping away, a state flower, perhaps, the address of an uncle, the capital of Paraguay. Whatever it is you are struggling to remember, it is not poised on the tip of your tongue, not even lurking in some obscure corner of your spleen. It has floated away down a dark mythological river whose name begins with an L, as far as you can recall. Well, on your own way to oblivion, where you will join those who have forgotten even how to swim and how to ride a bicycle. No wonder you rise in the middle of the night to look up the date of a battle in a book on war. No wonder the moon in the window seems to have drifted out of a poem, a love poem, that you used to know by heart. <laughs> This poem uh, contains a one, odd, a one, one odd word, and the word is snood. You know what snood is? It's sort of a, um, a net for, um, for a hair in the back. <clears throat> How I got into this poem? I don't know. But the poem is called Safe Travels. Every time Gulliver travels into another chapter, of Gulliver's travels. I marvel at how well-traveled he is, despite his incurable gullibility. <laughs> I don't enjoy traveling anymore, because, for instance, I still don't know the difference between a bloke and a chap. And I'm embarrassed whenever I have to hold out a palm of loose coins to a cashier, as if I were feeding a pigeon in the park. <laughs> like Proust, I see only trouble in store if I leave my room, which is not lined with cork, only sheets of wallpaper featuring orange flowers and little green vines. Of course, any time I want, I can travel in my imagination, 
but only as far as Toronto, <laughs> where, from, where some graduate students with goatees and snoods are translating my poems into Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with being Canadian. My mother is Canadian, so but that's as far as I can get. I was reading the poems of Elizabeth Bishop, and on facing pages, she has on one side a poem called Sleeping on the Ceiling, and the other side a poem called Sleeping Standing Up. <clears throat> so that struck me, and I thought, well, maybe I'll take the conservative route here and write a poem called Sleeping on My Side. <laughs> and um, another, the only, the only other thing to note about the poem is, and I guess all of us poets think we should listen to our poems and not force them to some foregone conclusion. And about halfway through this poem, the poem was showing sonnet-like characteristics, or it wanted to be a sonnet. So I said to the poem, I'm not going to just start all over again, but I will from now, from this point on, um, be more sonnet-like. <laughs> so it sort of turns into a sonnet midway through. <laughs> Sleeping on my side. Every night, no matter where I am, when I lie down, I turn my back on half the world. At home it's the east I ignore, with its theaters and silverware as I face the adventurous West. But when I'm on the road in some hotel's room 213 or 402, I could be pointed anywhere, yet I hardly care as long as you are there facing the other way. So we are defended in all degrees, and my left ear is pressing down as if listening for hoofbeats in the ground. And this is, so it also turned into a love poem, and this is similar. Um, it's a poem called, um, well, it's a poem based on, I would say, an unwanted thought <clears throat> that, that, that bubbles up to, into our heads. A question. It's in the form of a question. And the question is, who goes first? Um, a friend of mine said he, he couldn't sleep at night sometimes because he, he was wondering which Everly brother would go first. <laughs> and <clears throat> this applies to all sorts of human relationships. And there is, I later learned, an Arabic word for this, which I will phrase for, which I'll mispronounce. It's, I think, Yab Barni, a declaration of the hope that one dies before the other. Me first is the poem. We often fly together in the sky, and we're always okay. There's our luggage now waiting for us on the carousel. And we drive lots of places in all manner of hectic traffic, yet here we are pulling in the driveway again. So many opportunities to die together, yet no meteor has hit our house, no tornado has lifted up us into its funnel. The odds say then, that one of us will go first before the other, like heading off into a heavy snowstorm, leaving the other one behind to stand in the kitchen or lie on the bed under the fan. So why not let me, the older one, go first? I don't want to see you everywhere as I wait for the snow to stop before setting out with a crooked stick calling your name. <clears throat> this is a. <clears throat> I have a number of poems about Ireland, but I'm not trying to. I'm not going to try to win your favor by reading a lot of Irish poems. Um, but here's a little one called. Um, I'm going to do it in other ways. Uh, it's a little nine-line poem called Irish Spider. It was well worth traveling this far, just to sit in a box of sunlight by a window in a cottage, with a cup of steaming tea and to watch an Irish spider waiting at the center of his dewy web, pretending to be just any spider at all, a spider without a nation, but not fooling me for a minute. <laughs> um, this is a poem of... Uh, 
a type of poem <coughs> where where one wants to write um, where one loves another poem of someone else's so much that you feel like writing a response to it or you want to hop on its coattails and the, and so you do a kind of version of it and uh, there's an etiquette for that which is that you use this I mean you're it's quite uh, an overt um, activity and you don't hide any of that so you you use the same title and then um, <clears throat> you put under the title the phrase after the original author so after Whitman or whatever and um, <clears throat> so I wanted to write a poem uh, <coughs> Uh, uh, kind of a response to um, a, a poem by the Chinese poet Li Po, and he has a poem called, a beautiful poem called Drinking Alone. And I thought, well, I've done some of that, I had some experience there. So um, I set forth, but with kind of forgetting what I started out to do. <clears throat> Drinking Alone after Li Po. This is not after Li Po the way the state is after me for neglecting to pay all my taxes, <laughs> nor the way I am after the woman in front of me on the long line at the post office. Li Po, I am not saying after you, as I stand holding open one of the heavy glass doors that divide the centuries in a long corridor of glass doors. No, the only way this is after you is in the way they say, it's just one thing after another, like the way I will pause to raise a glass of wine to you after I finish writing this poem. So let me get back to sitting in the wind alone among the pines with a pencil in my hand. After all, you had your turn and mine will soon be done. Then someone else will sit here after me. <laughs> Gonna shed this. It's a little warm. Um, <coughs> um, this is a poem about <coughs> attempting to talk to an adolescent, <coughs> an advanced one. Not, not, I mean, like not an advanced one, rather, but not like like we am. Um, <laughs> someone said, "Never try to cheer up a teenager." <coughs> <coughs> it just makes matters worse. Um, but the poem is called, uh, To My Favorite Seventeen-Year-Old High School Girl. Do you realize that if you started building the Parthenon on the day you were born, you would be all done in only one more year? <laughs> of course, you couldn't have done that alone, so never mind. You're fine just as you are. You are loved for simply being yourself. But did you know that at your age, Judy Garland was pulling down $150,000 a picture? <laughs> Joan of Arc was leading the French army to victory? And Blaise Pascal had cleaned up his room? <laughs> no, wait, he's the one who invented the calculator. <clears throat> of course, there will be time for all that later in your life, after you come out of your room <laughs> and begin to blossom. <laughs> or at least pick up all your socks. <laughs> For some reason, I keep remembering that Lady Jane Grey was Queen of England when she was only 15. <laughs> but then she was beheaded, so never mind her as a role model. <laughs> <laughs> but a few centuries later, when he was your age, Franz Schubert was doing the dishes for his family, but that did not keep him from composing two symphonies, four operas, and two complete masses as a youngster. But of course, that was in Austria at the height of romantic lyricism, not here in the suburbs of Cleveland. Frankly, who cares if Annie Oakley was a crack shot at 15, or if Maria Callas debuted as Tosk at 17, we think you are special by just being you, playing with your food and staring into space. <laughs> by, by the way, I lied about Schubert doing the dishes, but that doesn't mean he never helped out around the house. <laughs> In the American South, you're supposed to say, bless her heart, after you say something like that. <laughs> um, 
Um, <clears throat> well, going back to the age of forgetfulness here, this is a, um, a poem that refers to uh, back to the 20th century, which you remember somewhat, I take it, parts of it. But one of the things that was uh, interesting or mandatory, as I should say, about the 20th century is that we, um, we, we had an odd attitude, we had a kind of simple, simplifying attitude toward the past and that we tended to divide the past into decades, like the 50s or the 70s, and by doing that, kind of tamed the past, this, this odd thing where the present seems to be um, eternally disappearing into something that you could handle. And we were always made, I felt, to feel nostalgia about these passing decades as if we wanted to be stuck in one of them forever. So this, that's why the, this poem is called Nostalgia. Remember the 1340s? We were doing a dance called the Catapult. You always wore brown, the color craze of the decade. Then I was trained in one of those capes that were popular, the ones with unicorns and pomegranates and needlework. Everyone would pause for beer and onions in the afternoon. And at night, we would play a game called Find the Cow. Everything was hand-lettered back then, not like today. Where is the summer of 1572 gone? <laughs> Brocade and sonnet marathons with a rage. We used to dress up in the flags of rival baronies, then conquer one another in cold rooms of stone. Out on the dance floor, we were all doing the struggle. While your sister practiced the Daphne all alone in her room. We borrowed the jargon of farriers for our slang. These days, language seems transparent, a badly broken code. The 1790s will never come again. Childhood was big. People would take walks to the very tops of hills and write down what they saw in their journals without speaking. Our collars were high, our hats were extremely soft. We would surprise each other with alphabets made of twigs. It was a wonderful time to be alive or even dead. <laughs> I am very fond of the period between 1815 and 1821. Europe trembled while we sat still for our portraits. And I would love to return to 1901, if only for a moment. Time enough to wind up a music box and do a few dance steps. Or shoot me back to 1922 or 1941, or at least let me recapture the serenity of last month, when we picked berries together and glided through afternoons in a canoe. Even this morning would be an improvement over the present. <laughs> I was in the garden then, surrounded by the hum of bees and the Latin names of flowers, watching the early light flash off the slanted windows of the greenhouse and silver the limbs on the rows of dark hemlocks. As usual, I was thinking about the moments of the past, letting my memory rush over them like water rushing over the stones on the bottom of a stream. I was even thinking a little about the future, that place where people are doing a dance we cannot imagine, a dance whose name we can only guess. So that's one of those poems that once you have Remember the 1340s, you're pretty much off and running. Um, not to say that it wrote itself, but it suggested a future for itself. Um, let me just get through these papers here and see where we are. Right. Here's a poem called The Trouble with Poetry. It's not that long. It's only about one of the troubles. <laughs> the trouble with poetry. The trouble with poetry, I realized as I walked along a beach one night, cold Florida sand under my bare feet, a show of stars in the sky. The trouble with poetry is that it encourages the writing of more poetry more guppies crowding the fish tank, 
more baby rabbits hopping out of their mothers into the dewy grass. And how will it ever end unless the day finally arrives when we have compared everything in the world to everything else in the world, <laughs> and there is nothing left to do then but quietly close our notebooks and sit with our hands folded on our desks. Poetry fills me with joy, and I rise like a feather in the wind. Poetry fills me with sorrow, and I sink like a chain flung from a bridge. But mostly, poetry fills me with the urge to write poetry, to sit in the dark and wait for a little flame to appear at the tip of my pencil. And along with that, the longing to steal, to break into the poems of others with a flashlight and a ski mask. <laughs> and what an unmarried band of thieves we are, cut purses, common shoplifters, I thought to myself, as a cold wave swirled around my feet, and the lighthouse moved its megaphone over the sea which is an image I stole directly from Lawrence Ferlinghetti, <laughs> to be perfectly honest for a moment. The bicycling poet of San Francisco, whose little amusement park of a book I used to carry in a side pocket of my uniform up and down the treacherous halls of high school. Ferlinghetti turned uh, 100 uh, today, or yesterday? Well, this week, the end of this week. I'm not sure he's bicycle anymore, but he did a lot of that. Um, here's a tiny poem called, and I love that people are reading small poems, not that, that they should be short, because they're over quickly, but when I get a book of poems, well, I don't think anyone reads a book of poems beginning to end, unless you're doing an assignment like reviewing or something, but... I always look for a short poem as a way in. This is just uh, eight lines long. It's called No Time. No Time. In a rush this weekday morning, I tap the horn as I speed past the cemetery where my parents lie buried side by side under a smooth slab of granite. Then all day long, I think of him rising up to give me that look of knowing disapproval, while my mother calmly tells him to lie back down. <laughs> I just think that would be a good assignment to uh, for write a poem about your dead parents that makes people laugh. <laughs> This is a poem that um, is a sort of send-up of a convention in European love poetry that is familiar to all of us. And that is the convention, the convention of um, um, male, male poets um, in male poet poetry of uh, flattering the woman uh, by comparison and uh, trying to make headway <coughs> by uh, the ingenuity of your comparisons so your eyes are like stars and the rest of it. You would think that would be put to, put to an end when Shakespeare said, my mistress is nothing like the sun, but um, it went on unabated and continues to this day. <clears throat> so it seemed that po these poets knew, what, um, knew the answer to that insulting question of Freud's, what do women want? And it seems that they don't want, among other things, loyalty or passion or fidelity or companionship. They just want similes. They just want to be compared to stuff. That's it. So I came across this poem by a Belgian poet I had never heard of and still haven't heard of. I hope not to hear of. And he wrote a, you know, about a two and a half, two page poem uh, just uh, until he run out, ran out of um, um, metaphoric gas just comparing her to everything. He starts out his poem like this, you are the bread and the knife, the crystal goblet and the wine. And I, I take up those two lines in my poem called Litany. You are the bread and the knife, the crystal goblet and the wine. You are the dew on the morning grass and the burning wheel of the sun. You are the white apron of the baker and the marsh bird suddenly in flight. 
However, you are not the wind in the orchard, the plums on the counter, or the house of cards. And you are certainly not the pine-scented air. There is no way you are the pine-scented air. <laughs> it is possible that you are the fish under the bridge, maybe even the pigeon on the general's head, but you are not even close to being the field of cornflowers at dusk. And a quick look in the mirror will show that you are neither the boots in the corner nor the boat asleep in its boathouse. It might interest you to know, speaking of the plentiful imagery of the world, that I am the sound of rain on the roof. <laughs> I also happen to be the shooting star, the evening paper blowing down an alley, and the basket of chestnuts on the kitchen table. I am also the moon and the trees and the blind woman's teacup. But don't worry, I am not the bread in the night. You are still the bread in the night. You will always be the bread in the night. Not to mention the crystal goblet and somehow the wine. <laughs> Well, we had the <clears throat> we had the 70, 75 year old dog. Here's one more, one more pooch. <clears throat> it's very hard to write poems about pets, even probably even parakeets or whatever, without getting sentimental. And um, I've written a number of poems that that lean toward um, that lose, you might say, ironic traction and uh, end up in a puddle of sentimentality, but. I thought I'd try this out, to try to write a poem about a dog that is free of sentiment. Allergy. <clears throat> and it's called The Revenant, you know, a ghost. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Revenant. I am the dog you put to sleep, as you like to call the needle of oblivion. Come back to tell you this simple thing. I never liked you. <laughs> when I licked your face, I thought of biting off your nose. When I watched you toweling yourself dry, I wanted to leap and unman you with a snap. I resented the way you moved, your lack of animal grace, the way you would sit in a chair to eat, a napkin on your lap, a knife in your hand. I would have run away, but I was too weak. A trick you taught me while I was learning to sit and heal, and greatest of insults, shake hands without a hand. I admit the sight of the leash would excite me, but only because it meant I was about to smell things you had never touched. <laughs> you do not want to believe this, but I have no reason to lie. I hated the car, hated the rubber toys, disliked your friends and worse, your relatives. <laughs> The jingling of my tags drove me mad. You always scratched me in the wrong place. <laughs> All I ever wanted from you was food and fresh water in my metal bulbs. While you slept, I watched you breathe as the moon rose in the sky. It took all of my strength not to raise my head and howl. Now I am free of the collar, free of the yellow raincoat, monogram sweater, the absurdity of your lawn. And that is all you need to know about this place, except what you already supposed, and are glad it did not happen sooner, that everyone here can read and write, the dogs in poetry, the cats and all the others in prose. <laughs> Say um, <clears throat> just some. I mean, I think one of the. I guess if you'd guess about the prehistoric origins of poetry, it probably all begins as a memory memory system uh, based on <clears throat> memorizable rhymes and uh, and a beat. Um, and often, I think that remains uh, to this day that um, we write something down because we realize that it'll float away into these rivers of amnesia unless we just capture it in some kind of um, amber. <clears throat> so this is just something I saw on a train 
commuter train, <coughs> the commuter train in New York, it's called Love. The boy at the far end of the train car kept looking behind him as if he were afraid or expecting someone. And then she appeared in the glass door of the forward car and he rose and opened the door and let her in. And she entered the car carrying a large black case in the unmistakable shape of a cello. She looked like an angel with a high forehead and somber eyes and her hair was tied up behind her neck with a black bow. And because of all that, he seemed a little awkward in his happiness to see her, where she was simply there, perfectly existing as a creature with a soft face who played the cello. And the reason I am writing this on the back of a manila envelope, now that they have left the train together, is to tell you that when she turned to lift the large, delicate cello onto the overhead rack, I saw him looking up at her and what she was doing, the way the eyes of saints are painted when they are looking up at God, when he is doing something remarkable, something that identifies him as God. Not sure what that was, but we seem to be getting along without it. <laughs> Road overboard. Okay, we're. Let's see. Okay, well, just a few more. Uh, a couple of poems from a newer book called "The Rain in, Rain in Portugal." And the rain in Port, the title. Uh, we're actually going to Portugal. I've never been there. We're going in a couple of months, I think. And um, I hope they're not expecting poems about Portugal because <laughs> the title of the Raven in Portugal is just um, a trigger warning that I don't rhyme very well. Um, and, and what's really in the, uh, the title is the absence of Spain. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, um, well, we've heard, we've heard a couple of dogs. Here's, a, here's just for the for cat people. Here's a little cat poem, uh, only eight lines long. And, <clears throat> excuse me, it's called Predator. Predator. It takes only a minute to bury a wren. Two trowels fill, full of dirt, and he's in. The cat at the threshold is longer in doubt, deciding whether to stay in or go out. <laughs> and this is a poem simply called <clears throat> The Date, 1960. In the old joke, the marriage counselor tells the couple who never talks anymore to go to a jazz club, because at a jazz club, everyone talks during the bass solo. <laughs> But of course, no one starts talking just because of a bass solo or any other solo for that matter. The quieter bass solo just reveals the people in the club who have been talking all along, the same ones you can hear on some well-known recordings. Bill Evans, for example, who is opening a new door into the piano while some guy chats up his date at one of the little tables in the back. I have listened to that album so many times, I can anticipate the moment of its drunken laugh as if it were a strange note in the tune. And so, anonymous man, you have become part of my listening, your romance, a romance lost in the past, and a reminder somehow that each member of that trio has died since then, and maybe so have you, and sadly, Maybe she. <clears throat> um, I don't know. There are, there are probably some people who are um, have only child syndrome. I would say ch only children out there, but I don't think you can pluralize only children. It has to be only child. Many only childs would be a best way to do. Uh, so I'm one of them, and um, this is a poem that addresses that that uh, condition. Only child. I never wished for a sibling, boy or girl. Center of the universe, I had the back of my parents' car all to myself. I could look out one window 
then slide over to the other window without any quibbling over territorial rights. And whenever I played a game on the floor of my bedroom, it was always my turn. Not until my parents entered their 90s did I long for a sister, a nurse I named Mary, who worked in a hospital five minutes away from their house and would drop everything, even a thermometer, whenever I called. Be there in a jiff and on my way were two of her favorite expressions. <laughs> and now that the parents are dead, I wish I could meet Mary for coffee every now and then at that Italian place with the blue awning, where we would sit and reminisce even on rainy days. I would gaze into her green eyes and see my parents, my mother looking out of Mary's right eye, and my father staring out of her left, <laughs> which would only remind me of what an odd duck I was as a child a little prince and a loner who would break off from his gang of friends on, on a Saturday and find a hedge to hide behind. And I would tell Mary all about that too and never embarrass her by asking about her non-existence. And maybe we would have another espresso and a pastry and I would always pay the bill and walk her home. Um, I think we're just about ending here. So, let's just see if I've skipped any, any essential points in my lecture here. <laughs> it's all supposed to come together here at the end. Um, let's see, let me read. Um, I'll read, um, yeah, just two poems. Um, one is called, um, what is called Aristotle, and uh, I just came out of you know looking looking at uh, Aristotle's Poetics, and uh, and uh, looking at that passage where he talks about things having a beginning, a middle, and an end. Um, it's odd that he gets so excited about that because we all pretty much take that for granted. <laughs> but he says things like you know the middle comes before the ending and. <laughs> he goes on about a little, a little bit longer than you think was necessary. But I thought I'd, I'd uh, write a poem that can conform to the Aristotelian unities <clears throat> and is just called Aristotle. This is the beginning. Almost anything can happen here. This is where you find the creation of light, a fish wriggling onto land the first word of paradise lost on an empty page. Think of an egg, the letter A, a woman ironing on a bare stage as the heavy curtain rises. This is the very beginning. The first person narrator introduces himself and tells us about his lineage. The mezzo-soprano stands in the wings. Here the climbers are studying a map or pulling on their long woolen socks. This is early on. Years before the ark, dawn. The profile of an animal is being smeared on the wall of a cave, and you have not yet learned to crawl. This is the opening, the gambit, a pawn moving forward an inch. This is your first night with her, your first night without her. This is the first part where the elevator begins its ascent before the doors lurch apart. This is the middle. Things have had time to get complicated. Messy, really. Nothing is simple anymore. Cities have sprouted up along the rivers, teeming with people at cross purposes. A million schemes, a million wild looks. Disappointment unshoulders his knapsack here and pitches his ragged tent. This is the sticky part where the plot congeals where the action suddenly reverses or swerves off in some outrageous direction. Here the narrator devotes a long paragraph to why Miriam does not want Edward's child. Someone hides a letter under a pillow. Here the aria rises to a pitch, a song of betrayal salted with revenge, and the climbing party is stuck on a ledge halfway up the mountain. 
This is the bridge, the painful modulation. This is the thick of things. So much is crowded into the middle. The guitars of Spain, piles of ripe avocados, Russian uniforms, noisy parties, lakeside kisses, arguments heard through a wall. Too much to name, too much to think about. And this is the end. The car running out of road, the river losing its name in an ocean, the long nose of the photographed horse touching the white electronic line. This is the colophon, the last elephant in the parade, the empty wheelchair and pigeons floating down in the evening. Here the stage is littered with bodies. The narrator leads the characters to their cells and the climbers are in their graves. It is you hitting the period and me closing the book. It is Sylvia Plath in the kitchen and St. Clement with an anchor around his neck. This is the final bit, thinking away to nothing. This is the end, according to Aristotle. What we have all been waiting for, what everything comes down to, the destination we cannot help imagining, a streak of light in the sky, a hat on a peg, and outside the cabin, falling leaves. Thank you. I think we'll leave it at that. Thanks. You're so grown up now. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about how old I am. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think it's really interesting to hear the story of Sylvia and the Colophon. Yeah. Um, I think it's really interesting to hear the story of Sylvia and the Colophon. Yeah. I think it's really interesting to hear the story of Sylvia and the Colophon. Yeah. I think it's really interesting to hear the story of Sylvia and the Colophon. Yeah. I think it's Every year, do you back to Ireland almost? Well, not every year, but I, I try to. I've been, yeah. I've been to Ireland, I don't know, maybe in the teens, maybe 13 times or something like that. Yeah, yeah. and you enjoy because I remember asking you when you were over 20 years ago, did you have Irish connections? And you didn't seem too kind of bothered about it, sure. Well, I, I wasn't. <laughs> well, I, I'm proud of my Irish connections. My, yeah. my father's family are from. Somewhere on Cork, and my, um, I wasn't, I've never been terribly interested in this specific genealogy. You know, I got digging up the old uncle or something. I just, every time I come to Ireland, I feel sort of tribally at home. Do you know, it's really more of a general to sense of just seeing someone on the street look, looks like someone in my family and stuff like that. But my, my, um, my cousin Bridie uh, recently um, found, seemed to find out that we're, the family's from Drimley. Um, oh, which is just down the road, pretty much. Yeah. And we visited, Suzanne and I visited Dribbley briefly last summer. Well, you can only visit it briefly. <laughs> <laughs> we wanted to stay longer, but I didn't think of a reason. <laughs> So I, I'm just going to ask you a few questions, and I, I will open it up to the audience. Pat might get mad, but I will open it up to the audience after I ask maybe three, three or four questions, because it's so special to have you here, and I know that um, my students are readers of your work, and obviously so many people in the audience are. Um, and I think of questions that I wanted to ask you since that workshop. Um, and one of them has to do with humour, because I don't know how to write a funny poem, and it's I dread the days that I go into a classroom and one of the, one of the students asks me, how do you write a funny poem? And I have not clue what to say, say to them. And so much of your work does begin with that moment of saying something funny or surreal and then the poem ends with poignancy, power and emotion. And even that poem litany, which uh, listening to the audience, everyone is kind of laughing throughout the whole poem. You are the bread and the knife, the crystal goblet and the wine. But when you end the poem, you are the crystal you are the bread and the knife, the crystal goblet, still... and somehow the wine. Yeah. That word, somehow, that's, that kind of acknowledges the awesomeness or mystery that's in there. But I just wonder if you consider that sort of dynamic, you know, between humour and, and something heavier. Well, when I started writing poems when I was your, your age, when I first met you, um, I, um, I didn't think uh, humour had a place in poetry, and I was correct. It, it, did, it did not. And my, my quick version of that is that 
English poetry or poetry in English uh, has always been funny. I mean, from its beginnings, um, and it runs funnily through Shakespeare, Chaucer, uh, Augustine satire, metaphysical wit, um, up, and then it comes to a screeching halt with uh, the English Romantic poets, who I imagine. Uh, got together, went into a back room, closed the door, and said, here's what we're going to, here's what's going to happen in poetry. We're getting rid of humor and sex, and we're substituting landscape. Seems <laughs> <laughs> like a bad deal, right? At the, end of, the thin end of that deal. But it wasn't until, really, I think, the 1950s with poets like Philip Larkin and, and Kavanaugh, in a way, um, and certainly in the New York School of Poets, where uh, humor kind of... Uh, um, retook its place, its legitimate place in poetry as one of the modes. So um, I was, I mean, as a high school kid, I was pretty funny. My father was funny, or we just dealt in humor. Most of my friends were hum uh, were humorous, but I didn't think it was allowed in poetry, and so I repressed all that. And it wasn't until I, I found these um, new influence, like uh, Kenneth Koch, and, and as I said, Larkin, William Matthews, who were using... Um, uh, humor and wit <clears throat> to, with serious intent, so that it wasn't poetry like light verse that just begins funny and, and stays funny and ends funny. It, it was a deployment of humor, uh, either the poem starts funny and gets dark, or it starts dark and loses its seriousness. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes a maneuver in poetry rather than a, a constant state of mind. But I think for, for students, if if, the, if they don't have a funny, um, if their epistemology isn't funny, you know, if they don't have a funny slant on life, there's no point in trying to be funny on paper. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned Chaucer, and, and, and I've heard you, you know, encourage people around the, you know, making poetry to take seriously the, the, the work of knowing poetry. And quite a few times I've heard you advise people, especially young or new poets, to read. Wordsworth read the classics and in another interview and I, I hope I'm quoting it correctly you said if you want to be trained in poetry you need to read Milton you said that's if you want to take it seriously if you don't want to take it seriously you can get a 79 cent pen and just express yourself <laughs> um, <laughs> but, well, something like that yeah. I mean, there's, there's yeah. no obvious training for poetry besides <laughs> MFA programs um, and we, you know, we could, that's a whole other subject. But if you wanted to be, if you wanted to be a landscape a painter in oil, you would learn something about linseed oil and how to mix color and all of that. You'd get a color wheel. If you wanted to play the bassoon, you would take lessons, and you wouldn't have a block of marble and just attack it with a humor, <laughs> hammer or something without knowing what to do. Um, so, but uh, anybody can just get out a pen and start writing down thoughts and feelings without training. But the training, and but you're writing kind of in a vacuum, and the training is just reading your predecessors and becoming part of it, realizing that all this has been said before you. Now, here you are, what do you have to add to the conversation? And um, you know, maybe you have something really interesting to add, and most good poets today do. Not that it's, it's blocked off to them, but I think without that, uh, you're writing without a sense of rhythm, for one thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and, it, and yeah. rhythm in terms of carrying on tradition and, and being aware that there is a certain kind of limit. You feel like you're, you're, one of the, you're, in, you're in a club. You're part, of the, you're, part of the, you're part of the scene, and you're not just... Um... Well, you know, if you take... Just this thing recently, if you take the, these two old words like form and content, one way to look at it is, um, I think when we start writing, we're, we're, we're more content. And the content is our misery, basically. I mean, in young poets, and I think it continues in some poets forever. <laughs> but if you look at it this way, um, content is, is the, the poem showing interest in the world. You know, it's looking at nature, it's, it's looking at beloved, uh, it's looking at clouds, it's looking at political problems. Form is the poet's interest in itself. It's the poem looking in a mirror and, and checking out how, it's, how it looks. How, 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 how are his stanzas tight? Are, his, are, his, are the lines isometric, like roughly the sign of length and that stuff? So um, uh, I think 
and maturity in, in a poet means moving from a very content-based to something that balances form and content. So the poem regarding itself is as interesting, even more interesting than the content. Mm -hmm. And I think the most helpful thing I ever heard you say was the poem really starts to work when you become more interested in the poem than in your stuff. And in your, right. in your stuff. It's an easier way to say it. Yeah. Well, you said it. You just said <laughs> it. Um, I just have just one one last question for you. You have a readership of millions of people, and even tonight we heard you address the reader, the thing, thing of you in your in your poems. And I just wondered, do you imagine a, a reader, or or who who do you imagine that person to be? I think the reader is me, in a way, because I'm reading it first. Um, and it's kind of odd to think of uh, me as my own reader, because I'm, I'm reading something that's not finished yet. You know? So I really don't think I'm a reader until the poem is finished. But um, in the experience of composition, I really am shuttling back and forth from being the writer to the reader. I'm always checking the self-expressive impulse against this, a stranger opening this poem in a bookstore and having it make sense to him or her. So um, I'm very reader conscious and I think this got kind of formulated, um, I th thought this way a long time ago, but when I read Stephen Dobbins' book uh, called uh, Best Words, Best Order, and that by the way is Coleridge's definition of poetry, and he's very, he's very unabashedly a, um, a reader-conscious poet. He says the idea of the poem is like some kind of communication, and the challenge of the poem is to capture and maintain the interest of a reader. And that, um, I don't think that's shared by um, every poet, um, to put it mildly. Mm -hmm. I, just have, I just have one more, just, yeah. uh, just like... Um, I'm in Ireland, I'm not going anywhere. I know, yeah, <laughs> and it's the last, it's the last um, event in all my efforts. But um, just something that I love that you read during your reading just now, you said poetry, and I didn't write it down fast enough, poetry fills me with joy, so it li lifts you up. Or, and, and then sorrow, but then poetry fills you with the urge um, to write poetry. And do you, like, ten, it's ten collections, isn't it? Ten collections? Ten, I think, yeah. Ten collections, then do you still feel that excitement when you have an idea or you see something or you... Well, I get, um, you know, I mean, it's momentary. I mean, as Seamus Heaney said, I'm not a poet all the time. I'm, I'm going, I'm doing the laundry and I'm driving and getting gasoline or something, but I'm, I'm doing poetry, I'm, I'm doing it. But um, what, what's exciting really is to um, discover other poets that I can uh, learn from would be a polite way to say it but uh, poets that would uh, I could find influence in and uh, to, to hear, hear, to get their resonances down and to kind of slide some of that into my own poems. And I think that's the way poetry progresses is through, um, is through influence. And if you come across a poet who seems, um, well, like the two poets we've seen tonight as examples who, see, who are very fresh and original, um, I'm uh, not, this is not to take anything away from them, but um, they have, I think, combined their influences in such a way that they're not detectable. I um, mean, I think an original poet is uh, someone who's taken influences and added something new and then did a kind of recombination of those influences, and that, that, uh, that's freshness in poetry. And who are you, who are you reading now in the context of modern American poetry? Um, well, Charles Simic, I just talk about him all the time. I think he is an amazing poet. And I, I used to, and sometimes if I feel stuck, I'll just bring down his collected poems and just read them for five or ten minutes. I'm not trying to read like him, I mean, write like him. Uh, no one can. But um, he, there's the virtue of kind of clarity and mystery. He uses a very simple vocabulary, simple verbal palette, just primary colors, basically very few adjectives, very few modifiers. And yet there's a tremendous amount of mystery in his short little poems. Fog coming in the street, someone standing, standing in front of a, a, shop, a closed shop at night, and uh, it, it's actually quite terrifying in a way. So, um, that, that just, I mean, there are too many to mention, but... Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, 
Will we throw it out to the audience? Do you have any questions? Like maybe three or four. That's okay, Pat, isn't it? Of course, it's the last okay. it's the last to get to right, we're, okay. we're pushing no words. So. All right, okay. Any any questions? Oh, yeah, um, I'm interested in the idea of uh, a responsibility to be intelligible to a reader or enjoyable by a reader, um, because I've got a, a poet friend who feels that that's um, cheating the reader by not making them do the work, whereas I think all readers are going to do the work, um, and if you make it too obscure, you're actually in combat with the reader in some way, but I never know whether I'm right or she is. Well, you are. Still have to take that back to her. I think, I mean, if anyone, anyone, who's, anyone who reads poetry, I think, comes into that experience realizing that they uh, have to do some of the work. It doesn't have to be heavy sledding. But um, it's a very participatory uh, type of writing. Um, some writing is completely uh, determinate. You know, it's the meaning is uh, completely stabilized, uh, like a cookbook. You know, it says like add a cup of sugar. You don't stop and say, well, sugar in what sense? <laughs> <laughs> what, 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 is she, what is she getting? At? Um, <laughs> but I'm, this is, a, this is a, a long thing, but if you go through uh, all of writing, through journalism, and finally you get to literature, and eventually you get to poetry, so at the far end from the cookbook is uh, poetry where meaning is somewhat fluid, and where ambiguity is a good thing. It's very frustrating for students. They want things to mean usually one thing, and uh, it's only when one matures a little bit as a reader that you see that ambiguity is really a, a thickening of meaning, a, um, uh, a pleasure, uh, an instability that's a pleasure. And also the, unre uh, the unreliable narrator about like, walking a 75-year-old dog, uh, the readers will accept that. <laughs> um, but, um, and then you can, you, can, you, can, you can play with the reader. You don't have to be completely, I think we're, we're often, as someone said earlier, uh, poetry doesn't have to be the, the sincere expression of fe personal feeling. In fact, sincerity didn't come into poetry until the English romantics. Before that, I mean, sincerity was not a, not a, not a, a positive uh, a criteria. Um, but I think the reader enjoys that kind of playful engagement also. Are there any of your own poems whose popularity annoys you, and who, <laughs> and which you're tired of reading in public? Well, no, not really. I'm just, uh, as my father said, there's a slice of ham in the best of us. Um, I, don't, <clears throat> I don't mind. I mean, I think the poem I read tonight, Forgetfulness, um, I just think it's very readable. Uh, we all have uh, memory slippage, so it tries to treat a very um, kind of human, uh, frailty in a, in a humorous way to begin with, and then uh, in a sad way at the end, if you've actually, if you used to know a poem by heart and you can't remember the first line, that's, that's a depletion that is uh, uh, seriously disappointing. <laughs> no, Charles Simic did a, a wonderful essay on your work, and he has a list of his favorite poems of yours in that list, and uh, I'd recommend anybody who hasn't read it to try and get their hands on it, especially since you didn't read any of those poems tonight. You read lots of other wonderful poems. Right. But, uh, but yeah, uh, I, 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 yeah, Simic justified wonderfully why those poems in particular were his favourites. He's a very smart essay, is too. It was a New York Review of Books, I think. Mm -hmm. I love the poem about um, the adolescent, the 17-year-old, and I was just wondering about your family. <laughs> uh, well, I, I don't have any children, so um, that, that was a, um, I would say, a future stepchild uh, who 
didn't talk to me for about two years. But, but I mean, the other thing is, um, I tried to convince her that the, the adolescent is being made fun of by an, an adult who is guilty of these uh, completely unrealistic comparisons of her to Joan of Arc and Maria Callas, and it's burdening this poor child with these, uh, these unrealistic expectations, but she wasn't buying that at all. <laughs> she didn't have a sense of ambiguity. She's 26 now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How would you know? Questions? Well, I'm sure Billy would be outside signing Great. books if books are for sale out of the, at the book table. And um, Billy, thank you so much for uh, finishing up the festival for us. We're so fond of you. We love having you here. And um, thank you so oh, much. It's very special to make a full circle with you and come back here and be yeah. on stage with you. Yeah, Thank mm -hmm. you.